Hey, welcome to 21 Days of Prayer. We're excited that you're here with us. Today we're going to look at one of my all-time favorite scripture passages found in John chapter 8. Now, a little bit of backstory before we get to our section. Jesus um, has already dealt with at the beginning of the chapter the situation where the Pharisees brought a woman who was caught in adultery to him. And what they were trying to do is they were trying to catch Jesus in a trap of what do you do because Jesus was speaking about love and mercy and God's forgiveness, but now they were uh, bringing a person to him who had been caught in sin, red-handed, and they wanted to see what he would do. And this is that time when Jesus utters those famous words, uh, he who is without sin should cast the first stone. And the scriptures tell us that the oldest Pharisees started to walk away first or the wisest ones started to walk away first. And so that's what has happened at the beginning of the chapter. And now there is this conversation between Jesus and the Pharisees and the people around him. And it's kind of a, um, a heated conversation or a heated debate. And we all can relate to that. We've all had conversations that have had conflict in them. So that is what Jesus is finding himself in. And what they're really beginning to discuss is who Jesus really is, uh, and what his purpose is. And I think all of us have to answer that question at some point in our lives. Who is Jesus? Is he simply a great teacher? Is he just a prophet? Is he a person? Um, is he an angel? Uh, or is he actually God incarnate, Emmanuel, God with us? Uh, C.S. Lewis has a quote um, that talks about this, about how, uh, you know, that Jesus um, is who he says he is. C.S. Lewis says that, and that he's trying to prevent anyone from saying a really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus, that they are ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but they don't accept his claim to be God. Uh, that is one thing that we cannot say. C.S. Lewis goes on to write, a man who is merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus did would either be uh, would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be an absolute lunatic on the level of a man who says he is a poached egg, I love that quote, or he would be the devil himself. And I think a lot of us probably in our time uh, with conversations with coworkers, friends or family members have probably experienced something of what C.S. Lewis was writing about how people are ready to accept him as a great moral teacher. Jesus is a good person. He has a lot of good things to say, but I just can't accept him as a, my savior or as God in flesh. And so throughout chapter eight, Jesus is having these interactions with them and they're wrestling with this question. And at one point, um, Jesus actually in verse 47 says the words that anyone who belongs to God and listens gladly to God's word um, belongs to him but you don't listen because you don't belong to God. So Jesus is telling these people that you don't belong to God because you aren't following the rules or what God's word has to say. Um, and obviously this really ticks the people off. And so the people reply back to Jesus, you Samaritan devil. Didn't we say all along you were possessed by a demon? Now calling Jesus a Samaritan is actually a racial slur and an innuendo that they really don't know who his father is. And then to drive their insult even further, they call him a demon. And so this is a vicious attack on Jesus. They are calling him a devil, right? They're calling him a demon. And what Jesus has come to do is to set them free from the power of Satan. Um, he's set them free. He has released people from demon possession. He has released them from sickness. He has released them um, from he even uh, claims that people, you know, when he heals them, your sins are forgiven, you can go. So this is a vicious attack. And now I want us to think about what we would do if we were in Jesus' shoes. If we're having this conversation, right, with somebody, we're, we're trying to help them understand what's best for them, but they're just not getting it, and now they're viciously attacking us. What would, us, what would we do? Uh, for some of us, we would probably just reply back um, with maybe a hateful statement or a mean statement trying to get back at them. Maybe for some of us, we would just throw up our hands. We would walk away. We would just end it. Um, but what Jesus does is really interesting. He continues to talk to them. And not only does he continue to talk to them, but he offers them the gift of eternal life. 
John chapter 8, verse 52. I tell you the truth, anyone who obeys my teachings will never die. So he offers them this. He says that they won't taste death. Um, and we know that the, this gospel, the gospel of John, ends with Jesus being killed, but with a resurrection. And the death of Jesus is explained as a substitute for us, for us sinners, um, for you and for me. In John chapter 10, and again in John chapter 11, Jesus says, I lay down my life for the sheep. That's for you and me. And for these people that Jesus is having this interaction with. So the uh, crowd continues to mock Jesus. And they say, like, what do you mean we won't die? Anyone who obeys your teaching will never die. Are you greater than Abraham? Now, Abraham is considered the father of the Israelite nation. He's the one that received the promise from God that he would become a great nation, my people. And so Abraham is held in the highest esteem uh, for these people that Jesus is talking to. So they go on to say, are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Now, this is one of my absolute favorite scripture passages. This is why I love this chapter of the Bible, because of what Jesus replies to them after they say, are you greater than our father Abraham? Jesus replies to them by saying, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was even born, I am. Now that is like the biggest mic drop in the history of mic drops. What Jesus is saying is that he is God. He is Yahweh. He is the God of Exodus 3 that met with Moses, whose name is Yahweh. Now, the people that Jesus is talking to here, like that would have blown, it blew their minds. They couldn't comprehend it. They had such great respect for the name Yahweh that in the Old Testament, they wouldn't even write the whole name out. They would um, omit the vowels. And so they had such high respect for this. And Jesus claims to be Yahweh himself. Now he could have said a lot of things. If he only wanted to claim pre-existence, he could have said before Abraham was, I was. No, he needs and wanted to drive the point home, who he really was. He means to say more than he was pre-existing Abraham. Before Abraham was, I am. This is the clearest most forthright claim in the Gospel of John that Jesus is in fact God. So the implications of this statement are absolutely staggering for the crowd that Jesus was talking to and for us as well. Um, it's, it's staggering for this world and for eternity because Jesus is God himself. His work on the cross and the words that he promised to us throughout the scripture will be totally successful. Think about that. Because he is God, his promises to you and to me will be completely successful without a shadow of a doubt. So if we actually believed this, I feel like a lot of the little anxieties in our life would completely disappear. We could learn to really surrender ourselves, our hopes, our dreams, our fears to Jesus because he is God, he is who he says he is. And I firmly believe that the world needs Jesus and we need Jesus. And I believe the world needs the courage of Christians who believe that Jesus is more than a great moral teacher, more than a good person. The world needs Christians who believe that Jesus is the great I am.